George, welcome. Good to Thank have you. you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, tell us about George Jacob. Uh, who is he? And uh, how did he sort of meander through life and get to your achievements and accomplishments that you have today? And they're huge. Sure. Um, I was born in Cochin. Never lived there. Um, grew up in Rajasthan. Um, went to boarding school for 11 years. Uh, graduated with a degree in museum studies. So museums have been part of my DNA. And um, it wasn't something that is normally pursued in India. Um, there were only a handful of institutions that focused on museology per se. Uh, but BITS Pilani offered a degree in uh, museum studies focused on science, technology, history of medicine, and engineering. So that fascinated me, and then I mm, started working for a science center in Jaipur. And that was sort of the starting of my uh, life in museums. You see, uh, I mean, when most of us think about a museum, it's uh, uh, painting and sculptures. Um, you take it to the next level. You see a museum as a healer. You see museums as a center of, of ideas and, and art and concepts which are way beyond art and sculpture. Can you share with us some of your thoughts about how a, a whole philosophy of a museum can be a healing experience? A healing experience? Well, it depends on the kind of museum. Um, there is an ICOM. ICOM is the International Council of Museums. There is an ICOM definition of what a museum is. And um, the definition has evolved over the last four decades. And currently, it's hotly debated. And the last conference in Kyoto focused on what should be the definition of a museum. But typically, any institution which was collections-based, which had material evidence of man and his environment, um, was deemed a museum. Any institution which was uh, more contemporary in that sense, uh, or was not collections-based, uh, or was reproductions-based, uh, was called a center or a gallery or, a, or an institution that focused on uh, the bridge between arts and crafts and so on and so forth. So there was a classical definition of museum, which was a collections-based institution, and that has evolved over time. Sorry, Museum of the Past, Museum of the Future. Correct. Uh, how do you connect, how do you bridge into this? Um, again, you know, once you understand what a museum is and uh, what its role is in civil societies, um, you can appreciate that civil societies are now being herded or um, they're evolving in certain ways. And um, if museums of the future have insights on uh, a way of life, and a way of evolution, then they become beacons of um, that trajectory. And that becomes a museum of the future. Um, it's a bit of an oxymoron, because museums usually are repositories of the past. Um, but if you can um, look at scenarios in the future that you control with today's actions, then it has a place in society which, um, which cannot be ignored. So you are finding. Uh, more and more futurists um, becoming part of this fabric. I'm a futurist myself, and uh, one of my topics is I learning from the future or leading from the future. And I can totally resonate with uh, exactly what uh, George is talking about is how do you project yourself in the future, live there, and come back from there. And uh, it's a very interesting journey because you're in the middle of nowhere. And a lot of things are happening. Uh, can we just also talk about the, the nexus of technology that's coming in now and, uh, and the kind of work that you do? So museums are essentially storytelling institutions. And if you have a medium that enables uh, more effective storytelling, that's where technology comes in. Um, the balance of you know, how much you want to overpower using technology is the key to telling a story effectively. And all depends on the demographics of the audience. You know, some audiences resonate more with technology, some don't. Um, so that's where the litmus test is to, to, 
to create that balance where you can actually harness technology more effectively to tell a story. Um, you know, some institutions do that better than the other. Others, um, the the um, the challenge is that the more technology you induce, uh, the more noise you create, and the more the life cycle cost of upgrading technology when uh, uh, something goes obsolete. How do you build these stories? I mean, uh, if, if you've been given a concept, what's the narrative that goes behind that? How do you navigate through that? So in museum parlance, it's called interpretive planning, um, which is essentially using artifacts to tell a story. Every now and then you'll find a kernel or a nugget that completes the story without any interpretive text. I'll give you an example. <coughs> there is a museum which is laced with technology and it's about World War II. And um, you, know, you have people engaged with technology all through different galleries. Till they actually come to a very small exhibit which is just a photograph. It's a small photograph, it's a Polaroid. And um, the Polaroid shows uh, a soldier uh, with his hands tied behind his back and the Japanese soldier about to chop his head off. So you have the sword, you have the kneeling soldier, you have the hands tied and the head is half bent and it's a Polaroid shot. That's all you need. Um, that particular exhibit held the attention of you know, pretty much every museum goer. The rest did not matter because that grabbed you and when you left the institution, you got the mission of, or the essence of the story. So the ability to look at what is that kernel that will resonate with a common denominator. I mean, you have the fringes where you have younger children or you have you know, a different demographic that doesn't resonate with your story, but you will find that common denominator that touches everybody. So there is a museum of broken relationships in Croatia, in uh, Zagreb. I don't know if you've been there. It's a very tiny museum. And um, mm, you know, a man and a woman, they fell out of marriage and they decided not to be angry with each other and they decided to create a museum of broken relationships. And they curated the story, you know, inviting people to contribute their own personal mm, situations on broken relationships. And there are, there's a combination of humor, wit, and sadness, and hope, all associated with this central story. And they tell the story in so many different ways. And then it graduated from a story between two people of falling out of love or relationship to a story that focuses on the conflict in the Balkans and uh, you know that turned neighbors against neighbors. And the relationship, the parenthesis of relationship became wider and wider. So depends on the topic and depends on how you want to tell the story that resonates with the common denominator. Uh, let's build the blocks of your life in terms of and your achievements and your credentials. Um, can you tell us about the fact that you've done over 100 museums and how does that work? Because you know, you're, each museum in my head would take years and years and years to do. Uh, how did you do 100 museums and what other notable stories that you have around building that? So I thought I'll put some slides together so that you have a visual uh, more than me talking about it. So I'm going to run through um, very rapidly a bunch of slides that gives you a spectrum of different projects that I've been involved with in the past. Um, starting with this first one here, it, this is in Jaipur. It's a science and tech center. It has a planetarium um, science museum and an observatory attached to it. And I became as a director at 25 many years ago. Um, bottom right is the Prime Minister of India. And then um, you see some of the visuals on the inside of the facility is privately funded. And uh, my next project was in Saudi Arabia. This is the King Abdulaziz al Darat Murabah Palace, the National Museum of Saudi Arabia. It was designed by a Japanese Canadian architect. Um, the museum consultants were in Toronto. The museum designers were in Toronto. The procurement happened in Toronto, so it was some sort of an implant that had some homegrown instincts attached to it, and that's the National Museum. 
And then UAE, I was involved with the National Archives here some years ago. And then uh, somebody mentioned fast cars in Formula One race um, earlier this evening. I designed six galleries for Ferrari in Yas Marina uh, between 2006 and 2008. Uh, if you haven't been there, you know, please check it out. Um, it was an ambitious project at that time. As you know, it's a $40 billion price tag built in 42 to 46 months with 37,000 workers on site. It has a 5.6 or 5.1 kilometer Formula One track on the island. Um, every simulator uh, was upwards of $3 million at that time, um, designed by a Dutch company called Cruden that used um, Ferrari data sets as part of the simulation. And then I, um, I worked on a number of assignments in Asia, including Singapore, as a Singapore Discovery Center, um, Oregon Museum of Science and Industry in Portland, Grand Teton National Park in, uh, in, um, in the United States. So that's Dick Cheney at the opening. And the Taiwan RC Center in Santa Barbara, Vine Museum in Napa Valley, uh, Whiting Forest Center in Michigan, uh, Riverbend Nature Center in Wichita Falls, um, that's a project with Nancy Reagan, the Reagan Public Library, and the St. Louis Science Center in uh, St. Louis, United States. Tillamook Forest Center, which was a site for a massive forest burn on the west coast of the United States. The Audubon Aquarium, Audubon Insectarium, and um, Hong Kong Wetland Center. Uh, Insect House in Hong Kong. I'm going to end pretty soon. No, Al <laughs> Alaska Visitor I'm Center. I'm exhausted. <laughs> This is the U-505 submarine at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, uh, Science Museum of Virginia. And then uh, there was a pause and a lull in something that I did which resonated with me personally a lot, which is the Star Spangled Banner um, at the Smithsonian. And this is the original banner that inspired the American National Anthem. So the banner was stitched in 1812 and flew over Fort McHenry where it was tattered and you can see you know, post-bombardment what the flag looked like. It's a gigantic flag, so the bottom left shows the human scale to the flag. And the flag, um, you know, the Smithsonian approached Ralph Lauren Apollo and said, look, your logo is a flag. And um, would you like to donate some money to restore this flag? And he, he donated $15 million to restore the national flag. And you can see people uh, on a harness um, trying to clean the wool bunting fabric. Um, so the flag had a linebacker, they took that out, they cleaned every thread, it took years and years to clean it, and then it was on a gantry, and then it finally went into a display in a bulletproof seismic loaded case. There are no electricals going in there, and you can see the size of this case, it's quite gigantic. Uh, I was one of the last people to leave the crypt, um, that's my crew checking for air leaks, and the flag is now on display at the Smithsonian at the American History Museum. The Braille flag, the, bra the Braille star that you see in the foreground is the size of each star that was on the Star Spangled Banner. And that's George Bush at the opening of the exhibit. This photograph, many of you may have seen in Iwo Jima, and that inspired the design for the National Marine Corps Museum in Quantico. So I did all the exhibits for the Marine Corps Museum, including all the battle scenes. And then um, these are projects for uh, a project um, was called Suzanne Mubarak Science Exploratory Center in uh, Egypt, outside of Cairo. And uh, you see some of those exhibits that range from stem cells to walk through heart to uh, um, you know, scan of the human eye and so on and so forth, and that's the complex. And Connecticut Science Center, which is designed by Cesar Pelli. And those are some of, you know, it gives you a spectrum of you know, various kinds of projects that I've been working on over the years. Some of them were happening in parallel. So on an average, I would be working on eight to 10 projects a year. And that's why the portfolio is uh, um, pretty heavy. Do you have a favorite? I mean, I'm, it's awesome. Uh, do you have a favorite? And there are some interesting challenges with some projects. And um, one of the challenges that I'm going to elaborate on is this one here. Uh, who has been to Hawaii? Have you been to the Big Island? Big Island, anyone? Um, the Big Island has the world's tallest mountain from the bottom of the ocean. So it's 14,000 feet below the ocean, about 13 and a half thousand above the ocean. So it's as tall as the Everest, more or less. It also offers the best optical conditions uh, to observe the stars. 
So the world's biggest optical telescopes are on Mauna Kea. Um, Gemini, Subaru, Keck, NASA IRTF, Caltech, Harvard Smithsonian Submillimeter Array, Canada, France, Hawaii. These are massive telescopes on Mauna Kea. There is, in the top left, you can see the twin domes of the Keck, Keck Observatory. And the peaks of Mauna Kea, yes, it snows there in December. Um, you can actually grab snow from there and go down to the beach and build a snowman. It has 11 microclimates. The uh, Big Island of Hawaii has 11 microclimates. It changes every 45 minutes you drive. And um, the story there was that these telescopes, you know, just like we have a church and an altar, you know, Hawaiians believe that the uh, church is the sky and the altar is the mountain. And on every altar, there is a telescope. There are 16 telescopes on Mauna Kea and uh, most of them without permission. So. Native Hawaiians have sacred sites there, and on top of it, the, um, the top of the mountain is declared a science reserve by the uh, University of Hawaii, which means that it's restricted access. You have to take permission to go up there. And that became a bone of contention. And uh, the divide between the Hawaiian groups and the astronomers, it grew and became very contentious, uh, so much so that they were willing to be incarcerated, and some of them wanted to dynamite the telescopes. And uh, I was sent there to figure out a method of mitigation that became a museum eventually. So that challenge of mitigation became um, something that, um, that was something that I wasn't prepared for, but I had to prepare myself for it uh, once I was there. I realized I was the eighth director to come on board. Seven others had come before me. The longest stay was two months. The shortest stay was two days. And um, so I prevailed there for four some years and um, ended up building a museum. These were uh, some of the early designs of uh, this museum that we were conceiving. So the initial idea was that I would take some federal dollars and then make sure that there are programs that dissipate the tension between the Hawaiian groups and the astronomy community. And that didn't seem to be a vi viable solution. And the solution was to create an institution, a living institution that respects the values of both communities and celebrates the notion of human ingenuity in exploring skies, um, our universe, who are we, are we alone? You know, all those questions that SETI and others explore constantly. And that, uh, you know, precipitated this meeting that you see here. It's a historic meeting. The directors of all 16 telescopes are in that room. And the, the, the Hawaiian stakeholders are in that room for the first time. So, uh, Kahu Kamona, Aha Hoi Kamona, um, Royal Order of Kamehameha. These are some of the groups um, that had serious differences with the astronomy community and the approach that um, was taken for the use of Mauna Kea as a mountain. There are three mountains on the Big Island, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, and Hualalai. And there is a mm, crater uh, called the Kilauea Crater, which is an active volcano. Um, the design that was conceived um, was a combination of the three mountains and the sunken crater. And this is what it looked like. Going back to the Hawaiian experience, there is a crater lake on Mauna Kea. So the umbilical cord of the firstborn Hawaiian sun is cut and wrapped in tea leaves and deposited on that lake. The lake is called Lake Waiau. And that you will not read in any book. And the realization that that is there connection with the mountain, um, it, it is a revelation of uh, some sorts that will change you eternally. Um, coming in from the cold and from the west coast, my first reaction was that, you know, there is something not adding up here, you know, what is so important about, um, you know, these peaks on a barren island um, or a mountain where you know, you want to dynamite something that has been installed on, on these peaks. And then you realize that it's because of the resonance that the community has or has had for centuries that is at the core of, you know, some of these values that are unspoken, unwritten. Poetry um, also has been effectively used in a number of museum settings. Um, and it's a powerful tool, um, slogans, poetry, um, posterization of an entire revolution. 
you know, when a society is in some sort of upheaval, a poster captures, you know, that upheaval in so many different ways. Um, you know, most recently, as you know, um, just last week, Barbados got its freedom. So it's no longer a Dominion um, or a British uh, colony in that sense. It is now a republic. And uh, in the Caribbean, uh, there is that sense of identity, which is um, sometimes, you know, people grapple with identity. And um, the, um, you know, the post-colonial societies uh, grapple with identity question in so many different ways. Um, from Philippines to Falklands, the sun never set on the British Empire. So from the east uh, side of the planet to the west side, you had 50 colonies. Um, there is a poet laureate by the name of Derek Walcott, and some of you may have you know, read some of his poems. And he talks about uh, the post-colonial angst, uh, which is uh, in, in some ways one of the most poignant ways in which he expresses that. And um, in one of his poems called The Schooner, he says, um, I come from a land where the sun, tired of the empire, sets in the west. In setting so, it gives birth to a thousand stars. Um, I had I had sound I had a sound English education in me. I had a little bit of Dutch, nigger, and English in me. I can roll up the sleeves of my shirt and bear the white scars on my brown skin. Either I'm a nation or I'm a nobody. There's nothing else that needs to be said after that, you know. So there are there are ways of you know bringing that to fore that would. Uh, move you uh, from the core. Thank you for that. Uh, it's a wonderful segue to talk about poetry and the Museum of the Future, which we can sort of see little bits, slivers of from here. What are your views? Because some of the calligraphy out there is poetry itself. And uh, what is your emotion that you feel when you see that during the day and at night? And I'm sure there are different emotions because I have them. What are yours? No, I think there is no other building like this in the world. So there is that, you know, that immediate association with um, something so spectacular. Um, it's, you know, symbolic. It's a work of art. It is representational. It has, um, you know, a grounding in local vernacular. It has a local vocabulary that is um, pretty spectacular. And, um, you know, with lighting at nighttime and it's, you know, visual impact during the daytime, it is this uh, beautiful orb that you cannot take your eyes away from. So that's the first reaction. The second reaction is curiosity. What is inside the Museum of the Future? Am I looking at technology? Am I looking at some mm, gizmos? Am I... Um, being challenged in some ways to think outside the box. Um, am I speculating about the future? Um, am I looking at future with, with um, open eyes, positivity, or shock, like Alvin Toffler would have you believe? <laughs> uh, those are some of the questions that would eventually draw people into um, the Museum of the Future. Um, but the key would be you know, what it offers in terms of content, and whether or not that content you know, excites you, uh, frightens you, or gives you a sense of uh, foresight and reason. Uh, those will depend on what is inside the uh, museum of the future. But before I get into the, um, you know, what I'm doing currently, um, you wanted to know a little bit about living museums yes. in the Himalayas. <laughs> in the Himalayas? Uh, yes, yeah. I, I, was, I was, okay, but let's do that first. Um, uh, Museum of Ideas, medium, uh, a whole is a completely different concept uh, in the foothills of uh, the Himalayas, and uh, perhaps you can share who built it and how, because the the cross section of different religions and experiences is quite interesting. Uh, right. So, Museum of the Future, for example, it's about ideas, and um, there are a number of museums that are coming up in different parts of the world that are about thoughts and ideas. Um, Museum of Human Rights 
in Winnipeg, Canada, is one such museum of ideas where the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is embodied in an exhibit form, and it's a museum of ideas. Um, some years ago, I was involved with a museum of faith and ideas, um, especially surrounding the concept of universalism, um, also known as Sikhism in some ways. Um, in the Himalayan foothills, the Shivalik Ranges, there is a um, holy city of the Sikhs called um, Anandpur Sahib. So the Golden Temple is in Amritsar, and Anandpur Sahib has um, a Gurdwara called Guru uh, Takht Keshkar Sahib, the uh, seat of the uncut beard. And that holy site um, is called the City of Joy, Anandpur Sahib. And this is that Gurdwara, Takht Keshkar Sahib. And this is what um, the Gurdwara's line of sight is with this new museum. There is a living uh, festival that happens uh, called Hola Mohalla in that location. And it's a massive festival of living arts. So everything from martial arts to um, um, uh, servitude is enacted in this location. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people come there every year. Um, the museum is situated in that location on a 100 acre site. Um, the that's sort of the complex, and this is the architect Moshe Safdi. Some of you may know. If you've been to Singapore, Marina Bay Sands is designed by Moshe Safdi. The Biodome in Montreal, the Skirball Museum, and Alice Walton's um, Museum in uh, in Arkansas, Crystal Bridges, um, Vancouver Public Library, and one of his most famous works is in Israel called Yad Vashem. So it's like a wedge that cuts a mountain. Moshe uh, designed this um, phenomenal museum. Like I mentioned, it's on a 100 acre site, 25 galleries, and a seven acre cascading pool. So you can see the scale of uh, this massive museum. This is the biggest museum in India. Um, and it's a museum of living traditions. It's a museum of universalism, Sikhism, um, almost Colosseum-like. I mean, you can see the 25 galleries girding a seven-acre cascading pool. And this is the museum at night. So this is what it looks like at night. And just one single gallery, this is the opening gallery. Uh, it's a rendering of the opening gallery. And the ramp that you see in the middle hairpins up three floors. And it's girded by the world's single largest hand-painted mural um, was painted by 600 artists, uh, folk artists. And this is the volumetric space. Um, very, very large. This is just the introductory gallery. And um, this is the finished gallery here. You can see some visuals of the finished gallery with lighting. So this is just the orientation space where you actually go and understand um, you know, the environment and the socioeconomic conditions uh, where Sikhism uh, was first conceived 500, 550 years ago, si nearly 600 years ago. And um, it was a society that was steeped in caste system. So it was, uh, so to come up with the notion of universalism where everything is equal, uh, everybody is equal, uh, was a new notion um, that was embraced by this community. And it's a thriving religion, as you know. So the entire story in all these galleries is a combination of folk art, symbolism, metaphor, you know, everything from paper lanterns to uh, hand-painted murals. There's no FedEx Kinkos there to go and repeal the graphics in the middle of nowhere. So most of the content was painted directly on the wall. Um, so both fresco bionos and sicos with wet plaster, dry plaster, everything was applied directly on the wall. And that became a unique uh, exhibit experience that you can see here in some of the galleries. The museum has a million dollars of fabric with all uh, vanishing uh, embroidery and techniques uh, that were deployed in that region, uh, populating different sections of this gallery. And then, of course, symbolism like this. Um, this is a shot from the opening of the event. Uh, you can see hundreds of thousands of people at the opening. Um, 
and that's the Canadian Prime Minister and his wife at the opening. So this is a, uh, a phenomenal exhibit experience where you actually wear headsets and um, you, you listen to a combination of prose and poetry as you go through the galleries. There is no interpretive text. There are only visual representations and that uh, you know, captures their 500 year history leading up to uh, India's uh, partition in 1947 and uh, leading up to 1980s and the political turbulence of 1980s. So it's a, it's a very different way of telling a story in this massive 650,000 square foot exhibit experience. Um, it's free, the lineup to get in is about two and a half, three hours. On weekends it can go up to four hours. Um, so that, that's the scale of the planning of this museum. The turrets that you see go up 120 feet. Um, so the scale of the building is almost castle-like. And the Sikhs have five tenants, Karakanga, Kachkripa, and Kesh, which form their, um, the uh, mariada or the pillars of their faith. So you can see the five petals. Instead of a dome, these petals are concave. They're upward facing, almost in prayer. Um, so that's the sort of symbolism of the building. There you go. That's what a museum looks like. <laughs> Yet another experience. It's another wow experience. Uh, we talk a lot about sustainability, environment, oceans, and uh, and uh, when I first met George, it was all about oceans and how oceans are literally, uh, you know, healthy oceans and healthy humans. And one of the phrases that I heard from George, and uh, that sort of is a nice little segue into. Uh, into the bay uh, ecotarium that you have today, and then we'll bring it back to uh, COP28, and then we'll wrap around, wrap sure. things around that. Sure. Um, great floods. So just before you know, getting into San Francisco, where I work on a climate and ocean museum, I was building a dinosaur museum in Canada, and um, this is northern Alberta, about 400 kilometers north of Edmonton. Um, this was a site where a uh, triceratops was discovered. It was a unique species called Pachyranosaurus lacustae. It was designed, it was discovered by a math teacher by accident. And um, pretty soon they discovered another one, and then another one, and another one. And it turned out that uh, during the uh, Great Flood, um, all these carcasses of the triceratops washed up one above the other. And they estimate 20,000 carcasses in one location, fossils in one location. And so that led to the creation of a museum called the Philip Jakery Dinosaur Museum. And um, I, you know, these are dinosaur tracks in, um, in northern Alberta. Top left, you can see you know, paleontologists rappelling up the cliffside. And there are thousands of dinosaur uh, footprints, sauropods, theropods, triceratops. You know, there are lots of animals traversing through this rock surface. This museum um, is the fastest museum built in Canadian history. 13 months for construction and uh, 32 weeks for everything else. Exhibits, lighting, augmented reality, articulated skeletons, and the building is designed like a dig site, it goes underground. That's Dan Aykroyd, um, the uh, Hollywood star on his Harley, um, leading a thousand bikers, um, that's Alaska Highway. Um, and those are the motorcycles that have reached the museum. And that's the opening day of the Dinosaur Museum. Uh, we offered helicopter rides to take people over the bone bed sites. Um, and that's Alaska Highway. And those are some inside shots of the building. So from uh, the Great Floods to the uh, um, late Cretaceous period, where you had uh, giant ocean dwelling animals, um, I came to be in San Francisco, uh, leading an aquarium where um, the mission is to transform the aquarium into a climate and ocean conservation living museum. Um, that's Mrs. Trudeau out there. And very quickly, this is the project that we're currently working on in San Francisco. Um, it is a very simple uh, architecture that covers the existing aquarium. So the existing aquarium is in that uh, underneath that big bubble. Um, it's a titanium laced frame, uh, a prefabricated structure with no pillars. And part of it is on land and part of it is in the ocean. And it has 
um, the San Francisco Bay as the lens for the ocean, where we currently hold about um, 24,000 animals in a million gallons of salt water. And that will go up to about 30,000 animals, and we'll hold about 2 million gallons of salt water. So that's the project I'm working on, focused on UN Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is life under the ocean. So SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, is one of the key catalysts uh, for COP28, <coughs> which is SDG 14. Um, the environment is really critical these days in terms of being able to start addressing that. And uh, we are fortunate that uh, uh, the UAE has uh, got the opportunity to, uh, to host COP28. And that's only 23 months away. And one of the reasons uh, George is here is to explore some ideas and some thoughts around um, COP28 and uh, what can be done around it. So in this early exploration, uh, George, where are you? What are your thoughts? Um, what should people be thinking about um, as you progress these conversations? So when we started designing this climate center in uh, San Francisco, we, um, we started getting inquiries from other countries where they wanted to set up climate and ocean conservation living centers. So this is, um, this is sort of the key feature list of what the center would hold. And uh, these are some of the impacts that the center would have. And we had Mrs. Biden there at the unveiling of the vision for the center. The next country that picked up the tab for working on this project in their own way was Jamaica. So um, we designed uh, something different for Jamaica. And these are early concepts that were approved by the Jamaican government uh, for $132 million. The building is pretty much a reverse upside down of our project in San Francisco. So there are three volumetric spaces um, that minimize the contact on the beach. So it's a beautiful site in Montego Bay. And you can see that uh, um, there is a waterfall that is cascading down 20 meters from the edge of one of the coral reef um, building renditions. And you can see a mangrove, a living mangrove on top of the other dome. Uh, and these are the three volumes. The biggest volume holds the aquarium as a lens with climate exhibits all around it. The second volume holds all the education components, uh, reverse dome theater and so on. And then the third volume holds a life support system that'll hold um, life support uh, uh, and HVAC systems for uh, 30,000 animals and 2.2 million gallons. Those are night shots of uh, when we cut all the lights. Uh, it's a combination of um, sea urchin cross sections and uh, alcorn coral. Um, it's another shot at night and bioluminescence key impact, and so on and so forth. The third project that came up was in Norway. So during the pandemic, uh, Norwegians wanted to set up a climate and ocean conservation living museum in Bergen, which is also known as the Ocean City. Um, what I'm sharing with you has not been shared with too many people. Um, this is how sperm whales sleep. Um, I don't know if, you <laughs> if you've encountered a sleeping colony of sperm whales. The sperm whale is the loudest animal on this planet. So it clicks at 230 decibels. So an F-35 or fighter jet takes off at 160 decibels. So the click of a sperm whale is 100 decibels more than that. It can paralyze you if you're near, near that animal. And it can tear your internal organs. The click is so loud, it can be heard 4,000 miles away. And so we wanted to capture the magic of the 16-foot animal and its ability to communicate in very complex clicks across thousands of miles that is being disrupted by cargo ships and submarines and everything that goes in the ocean. Um, and the gallery that I designed for them is, um, this is the volumetric space, and once you're in it, you're in the ocean, you're in the deep ocean. You are amid a colony of sperm whales that are sleeping. And um, you, you, you know, once you enter this lobby, ocean becomes your home. You look at ocean through a completely different lens. You also look at extinction, and you look, you look at you know, the extrapolations of climate change that lead to extinction at some point of time or the other. The plesiosaur was discovered in Norway some years ago, and so we kind of begin the story of melting polar ice caps. And there is that massive iceberg, uh, which is a projection device um, that has 360 mapping as well as top and bottom immersive content. So those are some of the, you know, 
ways in which we are um, addressing climate change in very immersive ways. And uh, with the UAE wanting to host uh, COP28 in 22 months from today, uh, they have an intrinsic responsibility for looking at divesting from fossil-based uh, uh, fuels uh, to look at reducing the carbon footprint. So the challenge, of the challenge of communicating that story is real. And if they want to tell that story on the heels of COP27 that is going to happen in Egypt, um, there isn't much time left. Uh, so we have some ideas that we would be sharing with uh, uh, you know, some of the powers that be and see if we could collaborate and do something jointly with the United States and UAE. It's interesting uh, that uh, we're talking about COP28 only 22 months away. And uh, um, in your world, 22 months is not a long time, is it, uh, to be able to produce something like this? It's, it's very tight. I mean, you're looking at, you know, if you want to create a, um, let's say, hypothetically, an 80 to 90,000 square foot exhibit, um, you're looking at, you know, a crew of 300 to 500 people, um, you know, 100 specialists uh, moving pretty much, you know, double shifts from now until the opening. Um, it's UAE's. very Dubai style, by the way. <laughs> it is, and it's, 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 it's certainly doable, and it's certainly doable with minimum margin of error. Um, I mean, if anyone can do it, Dubai can do it, UAE can do it. Um, they have the innate ability to mobilize resources, both fiscal resources and other resources, to make miracles happen. And I think with 166 world leaders expected here, 100,000 protesters, 30,000 delegates, and the world watching, on announcements divesting from fossil fuels. The uh, challenges are unique, but the opportunity is fantastic. Can we uh, look at uh, the extension of the life of uh, the Expo 2020 as a site uh, to build some kind of concept around, uh, around COP28? In, in other words, rather than just uh, start on a clean sheet of paper, we already have some key elements in there. So one of the things about um, sustainability, and you mentioned that you're working with a, a recyclable exhibit experience. Um, you know, the premise of repurposing existing uh, pavilions at Expo is in itself an exercise of recycling. So you're not abandoning something that was created for 24 months. You're actually recycling hardware, software, structural elements, whatever's, whatever can be salvaged from that site and repurposing it for the climate exhibit. So I think that is both symbolic and it's wise and it reduces the footprint and um, cost of the project. One of the things I have found fascinating talking to you is that uh, the learning that we have, the education for children, but education for older people, it's, uh, it's actually learning right across the entire spectrum of demographics. What are the, the learning examples or the learning experiences that you'd like to share with us that we should be looking out for, for our children, for our friends, uh, for the young people out there? I think uh, scenario building is at the core of it. So when you attend a climate conference or a sustainable ocean conference, there are papers um, and papers and papers and there are statistics and statistics and statistics and you get jaded after a while. Everybody has heard ad nauseum 1.5 degrees. Everybody has heard, you know, marine protected areas. Everybody's heard all these buzzwords. But the scenario doesn't ring home or get, you know, ring true till you actually immerse yourself in what that really means. Um, about a year and a half ago, or two years ago, I hosted the uh, uh, former prime minister of, uh, president of Kiribati. So Kiribati is that small island in the Pacific where, um, a slight you know, variance in ocean temperature will uh, drown that island completely. And um, it would create uh, the world's first climate refugees. Um, so that exodus is very real because the ocean is encroaching on their land, their lifestyle, their livelihood. And um, you know, they're really uh, worried about what's gonna happen to their community. So they have started purchasing land in other parts of the world and they've slowly started migrating 20,000 people uh, at a time to uh, repopulate in different locations. So that can become a reality. So this sort of a scenario building, which is immersive, engaging, interactive, where you control the variables, 
you know, with, you know, whether it's mobility, whether it's carbon footprint, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's acidification, whether it's sea level rise, you know, these variables are in your hands to a great degree. And, um, you know, the results of your policies or the results of inaction uh, can be witnessed in that scenario building process. How do we address this? I mean, how do we create urgency? I know everybody thinks it's, it's, it's the right thing to do, but what do we do to create urgency? Because at the moment, it seems uh, running at a glacial pace. I think um, the parts of the globe that are witnessing some crisis or the other, um, they have a cause to be worried first. So whether it's the pollution in New Delhi or in Mumbai, or floods in some other parts of the world, or you know severe weather patterns that are becoming more frequent, uh, those are some some elements that you know people kind of grapple with. But there are some invisible components that people don't grapple with. So, for example, every Google search is one gram of carbon. You know, there's 28 million metric tons of it generated just by Google searches every month, and it runs into billions. Um, NFTs, you know, the temperature in the hardware sh shops where the uh, the servers are sitting rises above 100 degrees. Um, so those are invisible carbon footprints. AI, for example, you know, with image recognition, let's say you put an AI device in a one mile stretch on a highway or on a bridge where um, the camera recognizes the make and model of your car and uh, your engine speed, let's say 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, and it knows how much carbon is emitted when an engine is speeding at that, that speed. And if you take a delta, you know how much GHG has been, you know, carbon footprint of the traffic on that bridge on an average during peak hours, non-peak hours, seasonal changes, trends, and so on and so forth. There are ways in which that message can hit home very quickly that this is something that we are doing and it's in our control. You know, whether through our devices, whether through our greed, whether through our urgency of securing something for convenience, whether it's engaging plastics, um, you know, those are, you know, some conscious check marks. But on the positive side, you also have innovations and inventions where we are actually grappling with many things. Um, plastic e eating bacteria or, you know, uh, things that we uh, find as amazing solutions or agitating nanocubes that can sequester carbon. So there are some very interesting research areas where human beings have made amazing progress, even if it has not hit the public domain or commercial domain, sooner or later it will. But the fact that we are striving to restore our coral reefs, creating hope spots around the world, focusing on marine protected areas, focusing on, you know, how to revive dead coral, um, passing all kinds of regulations which uh, prohibit certain activities, commercial activities, and so on and so forth. You're seeing some differences in a lot of, you know, parts of the world, which is hopeful. And um, on that message of hope, um, last month, eight Grammy winners wrote me a song. And um, it's called the Equitarium Song. And um, they, they said that we, we want to give you this song and they put a video together, which I'm gonna play for you. Please do, and then we'll end with that on a high. <laughs> and um, the person who actually took the lead on it is the drummer for Police, the band Police, um, Steve Copeland. And uh, he took it upon himself to bring other Grammy winners to the fold, to write us a song. And um, we really are grateful, and it's inspirational, and it's, um, you know, it, it fills us with hope that, you know, there are many voices that that want to see some good, good happen in the world.